Hello friends. It's a beautiful day in Southern Illinois again. We haven't had very many not beautiful days, have we? Uh, you're going to think I live in paradise. Uh, I'll try to stir up a storm for next week. So, In college, <clears throat> Vivian and I had this recurrent source of conflict. You see, we ate supper together almost every evening um, in the college cafeteria. We both lived in the dormitories and uh, the cafeteria was our food place, our gathering place, our romance place. And we would eat supper and then conversation would lag and I would stand up and start to go back to the dorm and study. And invariably, Vivian would say, No, don't go yet. Just be with me. Be with me. What does that translate to? I didn't even know what it meant, okay? Uh, I knew how to do things with people. I was a good doer. Still am. I knew how to listen. I was a good listener. But what does it mean to be with someone? How can you be a good beer? It mystified me. I, relationships and the nuances of how to form them with women were, well, it was beyond me. Okay. <clears throat> But somehow we hung in there and um, she said yes and we got married and uh, five years into our marriage a child came along, a wonderful child by the way Terrell, and um, by this time I was pretty far along in my education, I was in residency and that translated to long hours at the hospital long days of work, very short nights. I was tired. Well, I learned what it meant to be a doctor, which basically meant being tired most of the time. And when I came home in the evening, all my words were used up. Okay? I'd been with people all day long and I'm kind of an introvert. I need alone time to recharge my batteries. So when I came home, I just wanted to be alone, secluded, away. Vivian, on the other hand, she's a relational person. She likes to talk with people. She, she needs the emotional intensity of in intimacy with people and conversation. And after three or four days of having a two-year-old as her only conversationalist, when I got home, she was ready for some intense adult interaction. You see the conflict. Eventually, when a counselor got, got brought in and he came up with an ingenious solution, he said, okay, how about if we do some give and take here? When Steve gets home, he gets 15 minutes to unwind, no questions asked. He walks in the door and he can be alone after you greet each other. But after the end of 15 minutes, then you have to sit down on the couch, Steve. And for the next 15 minutes, you have to talk with Vivian. So, when I would come home, we would sit down on the couch, we would set the timer in the kitchen, this was before the days of cell phones, we would set the kitchen timer for 15 minutes and I would have to sit on the couch and talk with Vivian. Well, it didn't take very long to discover that that wasn't really that hard to do. I mean, we developed these kind of 
rituals, these habits. She would share what had happened in her life and get me caught up. And I would share what had happened in my life and I discovered that she was actually interested in my life and I wasn't talking Greek when I was talking about medicine. Sometimes I had to explain myself. But our couch time, pretty soon the timer wasn't needed and we just talked. The timer went by the wayside, but the couch time didn't. It's still a part of our lives. Our discover guide this week was entitled The Secret of Answered Prayer. The topic is obviously prayer. And it talks about how to pray, private prayer, public prayer, the seven secrets of answered prayer, and so on. It's full of cliches. Prayer is the breath of the soul. Prayer is the key that opens the door of heaven's storehouse. It's easy to miss, it was easy for, to miss for me, that this lesson is a turning point in the, the, the Bible study guides. You see, up until now, we've been talking about a lot of beliefs. The touchstones that we've been been rubbing up against have been things that the people in the Bible believed that affected their lives. We haven't talked much about doing. And that's easy for religious people and spiritual people to do. We argue about beliefs. We argue about right and wrong. Churches split up over arguments over beliefs. Children reject religion because they can't just can't believe what their parents believe. Last week I asserted that on Judgment Day it's our works that determine our fates. They either condemn us or justify us. Not our beliefs. Well, that goes counter to what we as Christians usually th think is going to happen in the judgment. Only believe. Righteousness by faith. Salvation comes by belief and not by works. Belief comes by the Word of God. It's easy to ignore the passages in the Bible that state clearly that faith without works is dead. And that conflict, that tension, finds its expression multiple places in the Bible. For example, Jesus, when Jesus described the judgment, he didn't say, well, you've got to believe this and believe this and believe this, and then you'll get into the kingdom of heaven. No. He talked about what people do, visiting the sick, ministering to the poor, nurturing those who are in prison. It wasn't what people believed that got people into the kingdom. It was what they did. And yet Paul asserts that nobody has been saved by works, by the keeping of the law. So what gives? And what does all this have to do with prayer? Well, I'm not going to belabor the point. This week I went back through and reviewed uh, the touchstones that we've rubbed up against so far. And it struck me that every touchstone that we've encountered, every belief, is in fact a description of what it takes to have a relationship with God. If I've not taken the risk of embracing the possibility of God, I'll never have a relationship with Him. If I misunderstand his character, or am ignorant of it, it will distinctly impact the relationship I have with him. And so on. And every week I've been inviting you, challenging you, to commit. To be 
more importantly, to embrace a relationship with God. A relationship does not exist at the level of beliefs. I can believe anything I want to about Vivian, but if that belief doesn't translate into action, then our relationship will be nil. A relationship requires belief translated into actions even if some of those actions are as unfathomable as being or as counterintuitive as sitting down on the couch when all you want to do is rest. Prayer is the heart and core, the heart and soul of a relationship with God. One of my favorite quotes, you can call it a cliche, about prayer is that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. So how does this play out in my life? I spend very little time in formal prayer, structured prayer. Vivian and I pray at meals, but it's not a formal saying of grace. There's no flowery language, no set formula. Instead, we simply thank God for the things that at the moment bring gratitude to our hearts. It's an exercise in gratitude and it, it impacts the way we think, the way we experience life and our relationship with God directly. I'm not big on telling God what to do. I don't keep a prayer list. I don't have a prayer journal. You see, Jesus said that the Father knows what we need. And all we have to do is ask Him. We don't have to demand. We don't have to do it repetitively. The Father knows what you need. What I do is I talk with Him all day long almost continuously. God's my best friend. And as I'm going through the day in my head, in my heart, as I run up to, against situations, I talk to him about them. So what do we do here, God? Boy, it's a beautiful today today, God. Thank you. I'm glad such beauty exists in this world. So on. I share with him what I'm feeling, what I'm doing. I talk about what I'm concerned about, who I'm concerned about, what I'm happy about. There is no flowery language in my prayers either. No, Almighty God, Thou Sovereign of the Universe. Okay? God's my Father. And I address him like that. Now, some people have objected to that because when I pray in public, I pray exactly the same way. And they've said, Steve, you'd never approach the President of the United States in such an informal fashion. That's true. The President isn't my father. I don't have a relationship with him. All I have is respect. But when you have an intimate relationship with someone that you respect, it's different. Respectful words are meaningless if your life is not respectful. And finally, silence is a normal part of a conversation between friends between intimates. And that happens in my relationship with God also. And that's okay. To me, that's a part of prayer. Neither of us are talking. We're just being. Yesterday, Vivian and I were sitting on the couch. It's 
been a rough week. My chronic fatigue syndrome has really been knocking me down most days. COVID has demanded a lot of, I completed three major projects to support our doctors this week, which is hard to do when you only have two or three hours of functional time a day, but I was able to do it. Yesterday we were sitting on the couch <coughs> talking, but when neither of us had very much to say, and uh, we were just sitting there, silent, I had my arm around her, she was cuddled up next to me, saying nothing, and then all of a sudden, abruptly, out of the blue, I just blurted out, ZEBRA! And then there was silence. And then I reached into my pocket and pulled out my phone. <clears throat> now what you don't know is that here in Fairfield, um, one of the lawn care services is Zebra Lawn Care. And what had crossed my mind was that Vivian and I had agreed that because of the way my chronic fatigue syndrome is impacting me and the load I'm carrying at work right now, uh, we agreed that we would contract with Zebra Lawn Care to mow our lawn. Maybe I will have time to get the uh, weeds out of the flower beds if I'm not spending that three hours a week mowing. So I pulled out my phone and I texted the owner of, of Zebra Lawn Care, Josh, Josh Cerlini. He does a great job for you, those of you who are local. And uh, I texted him and asked him if he could um, take over doing my lawn for the rest of the summer. And I laid my phone down and Vivian said, well that explains a lot. And I looked at her and she said, I didn't have a clue what you were talking about. Zebra! <sighs> you know, sometimes in our relationship with God, He says things we don't understand. And sometimes we get into these hilarious situations Yesterday, the word zebra had Vivian and I convulsed in laughter on the couch because I realized how disconnected our conversation was and yet how connected we were. So friends, if prayer is something that feels awkward, counterintuitive, two things might be going on. One, you may not have a relationship with God. There's a solution to that, because He is more than willing to enter in a conversation with you. But two, you may have to learn how to be with Him, how to talk with Him, how to open your heart to Him as a friend. So today, I'd like to break my tradition a little bit and end with a prayer. So, Father, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for the blessings that you've put into our lives. Father, I have friends who are really struggling now friend from Nigeria called me this week. They've only been able to eat one meal a, a day for the last month because of lots of issues. Father, I ask you to work in their lives, in the lives of everyone across the world who's struggling because of COVID, because of political instability, because of injustice. More than that, Father, I ask you to put into my heart what you want me to do. Be with us this week, Lord. Send your spirit to guide our footsteps. Be with each of my friends. And 
and I thank you. Amen. Be safe, my friends, and be prudent. There's no place in the world that's free from COVID right now. But above all, keep looking up. There's a better day coming. I'll see you next week.